nuclear holocaust. This is a phrase you wouldn't be surprised to hear during the Cold War. Tensions are at an all-time high between the United States and the Soviet Union. To make it worse, the United States catches wind of a new generation of Soviet fighters. The Su-27 Flanker and MiG-29 Fulcrum pose a serious threat to United States air superiority. And furthermore, the F-15 Eagle. In order to counter these next generation fighters, America does what we do best. We innovate. And so, the Advanced Tactical Fighter Program was born. A plethora of companies are given the option to create a fighter, combining supercruise, stealth, and advanced maneuverability. A force multiplier, giving one pilot the power to defeat 10. The goal of the ATF is to create the ultimate aircraft and the most dangerous thing in the sky. Only then will the United States claim true air superiority companies are given the contract and a chance to pitch their idea of the next generation fighter. By 1986, the program had narrowed down to two contenders, Northrop and Lockheed Martin. The remaining companies were given the chance to join the two winners, with Lockheed Martin taking in General Dynamics and Boeing, and Northrop taking in McDonnell Douglas, creator of the F-15. So, with both teams assembled and budgets in place, the race was on. The ATF will balance stealth, super cruise, and advanced avionics in a highly maneuverable fighter that will ensure that our pilots get first look and first kill. Thus, the ATF will ensure American air superiority well into the next century, and we plan to keep it that way as well. The program itself was extremely classified shrouded in secrecy. Every single person involved in the ATF understood the severity and what was at stake. Living in what they called the black world, they wouldn't even let their families know what they had been working on. People who know don't talk, and people who talk don't know. Intense security checks, windowless rooms, and nighttime operations were all too common during the production of these aircraft. This wasn't just a precaution though, it was necessary. Such advanced technologies were being used during the production of these aircraft? If that had fallen into enemy hands, the consequences would be unthinkable. The Lockheed Martin team had always been at the forefront of innovation when it came to military aviation. From their revolutionary U-2 spy plane, the SR-71 Blackbird, in the not yet debuted F-117 Nighthawk, Lockheed knew how to build planes, but not only that, they knew how to sell them too. To Northrop, Lockheed Martin was gonna be a fierce competitor as they would without a doubt pull out all the stops to win over the contractors. For the competition, two aircraft were manufactured. One included a Pratt & Whitney engine and the other a General Electric engine. At the same time of the aircraft manufacturers going head to head, these two engine companies were as well. These two YF-22s, as Lockheed called them, featured a blended wing body design while keeping a more conventional look. They featured an internal weapons bay and low observable shaping, much akin to Lockheed's F-117 Nighthawk. Though it had not been released to the public yet, Lockheed's YF-22 took key notes from the Nighthawk, especially when it came to stealth. With radar absorbing angles and materials, the YF-22 was practically invisible. The Lockheed team also put a special emphasis on thrust vectoring and maneuverability within their aircraft. Combining either the General Electric engine or the Pratt & Whitney engine with Lockheed's thrust vectoring technology, the YF-22 became as nimble and agile as one could imagine. With all these advancements and more coming from Lockheed Martin, it was looking like the odds were stacked up against Northrop. How would they take down this Goliath that was Lockheed Martin?
Northrop was known for bold concepts. They didn't build planes like everyone else did, and it had been that way since its conception with Jack Northrop, an aviation pioneer who spearheaded the flying wing, which ended up truly being ahead of its time, as Jack Northrop's dream had come to fruition with the B-2 stealth bomber. For the ATF competition, Northrop would create what was called the YF-23 Black Widow II. Named after its World War II predecessor, the Black Widow I, the Black Widow II would once again exceed expectations and break boundaries. When it came to design, the YF-23 took key notes from Northrop's past projects, such as the Tacit Blue and the B-2 Stealth Bomber. With very B-2-esque flowing panels and lines and diamond-shaped wings, the YF-23 looked out of this world. And contrary to its Lockheed Martin opponent, the YF-23 emphasized stealth. Northrop decided against thrust vectoring technology to lessen weight and increase stealth, opting for more conventional aerodynamic control. The YF-23 completely lacked horizontal stabilizers, incorporating a V-tail wing to control pitch and yaw. These design choices ultimately made the YF-23 much stealthier than the YF-22, giving it an even smaller RCS signature. If the YF-22 was practically invisible, the Black Widow II was invisible. The inner components of the plane itself were also extremely revolutionary. Onboard computer systems would do billions of calculations to keep the aircraft level and stable during flight. These computers were so powerful more powerful than most computers at the time, that when taxiing on the runway for its first flight, the YF-23's control surfaces started adjusting to the bumps on the runway. The S-shaped intakes also contributed to the stealth factors of the YF-23, as the engines would not be exposed to radar pings. The cockpit was situated high up, giving the pilot a near 360 view of his surroundings. Test pilots Jim Sandberg and Paul Metz recall when flying the plane, feeling like they were almost on top of it, instead of situated down in a cockpit. When testing the YF-23, daring test pilot Paul Metz claims it's the smoothest plane he had ever flown. Much like the YF-22, the development of the YF-23 was done in complete secrecy. Engine tests had to be done out in the forest, and apparently when doing such tests, they scared away the local alligators as well. Heavy use of flight simulators were employed from the beginning to the end of development. These simulators would sometimes be hooked up to a non-operational airframe so that Northrop engineers could get a gauge of what they were working with. They called this the Iron Bird. Northrop also put a huge emphasis on super cruise, or flying supersonic without using afterburner. You see, afterburner burns an insane amount of fuel, and is simply not useful long term. During later flight tests, tailing F-15 Eagles would have to go into afterburner just to catch up to the YF-23 in super cruise. To this day, it's not disclosed how fast the YF-23 could go. Some say 3.2 Mach, while on paper, we only know about 1.5 but can't assume too. Because of all the emphasis Northrop put on Super Cruise, most likely faster than the YF-22. Simply put, this thing was fast. The YF-23 boasted an internal weapons bay capable of high angle of attack maneuvers. Countless hours of blood, sweat, and tears was put into this plane. With everything that went into its development, Northrop believed their plane was the better of the two. Just like Lockheed, Northrop had two prototypes, Grey Ghost and Spider. Grey Ghost and Spider would undertake many test flights, landing and taking off, refueling, maneuvering. Aside from one landing gear jam that was ultimately fixed, all went pretty smoothly. The Northrop team had put their heart and soul into this aircraft. So when the time came for the phone call of who had won the ATF, they waited in suspense. The Northrop team had gotten the second of the two phone calls, and they knew what that meant. Lockheed Martin had ultimately gotten the contract, with a green light to produce what would become the F-22 Raptor for the United States. The Northrop team was absolutely destroyed. So much hard work that would ultimately become obsolete. They were told they'd have to demolish their own aircraft they had spent years of their lives making. 
Many refused. And so, Spider and Grey Ghost would sit in Edwards Air Force Base, rotting away in the desert. Until one fateful day, they'd be taken, to be restored, set up in museums. Grey Ghost would end up being put on display in the National Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. And as for Spider, it would go home to the Western Museum of Flight in California. Thankfully not lost to time, these aircraft sit in their designated museums for all to see. To see the love and the blood, sweat, and tears the Northrop team had put into them. To this day, some say the YF-23 should have won the contest. In my opinion, it's the cooler of the two planes. Honestly, my favorite plane of all time. But at the end of the day, it was a really fair fight and could have gone either way for differing reasons. One of the biggest what-ifs in aviation history. The YF-23 is truly a product of its time, much like the YF-22, which would end up becoming the Raptor, which is to this day the most powerful aircraft in the world. Unfortunately, production has stopped for the F-22. It's the Cold War. Simply was not a problem anymore. Ironically enough, we never needed an advanced tactical fighter. It may come handy in the future, but the reasons we created the program no longer existed. So the F-22 ended up in a similar boat to the YF-23, sitting in hangars, catching dust. The YF-23 was a technical marvel and a fearsome aircraft. I wonder what it would have been like if it had won. The changes that the YF-22 had undergone made it an even fiercer aircraft. So who knows what could have been done to the Black Widow too. Some delusional part of me likes to think there's a squadron of YF-23 still out there. Who knows, it could be true. After all, the YF-23 is one of the stealthiest aircraft ever made. I actually got a chance to see Grey Ghost in real life. Pav 1. And it is honestly like top 10 experiences ever. This plane is just insane to see in real life. It felt like an honor to be in the presence of such a powerful machine. You look at the aircraft and you admire its beauty, but you also have to admire the people at Northrop that created it. Without them, we wouldn't get to gaze on the beauty, this absolute masterpiece. The aim of this video was to tell the story of the Advanced Tactical Fighter Program, but also pay homage to the Northrop team and all their hard work that went into their ultimately disregarded airplane. And this is not to bring down the YF-22. The Raptor was an absolute marvel as well, an extremely advanced aircraft, and I believe it wasn't a bad choice at all, maybe even the right choice. At the end of the day, both aircraft deserve the love and appreciation. So with that, I'll say my goodbyes. Take care, guys.